All right, welcome, model collectors. Uh, I am Tommy Strobel with Diecast Emporium. I am joined by Joe from Diecast Mania, and today we're going to be going over some new releases from various companies and various scales, as well as our thoughts on them. And we'll we'll go from there and see where that leads. We'll hopefully uh, keep ourselves out of trouble here. We're we're both kind of learning the nuances of of doing this over Zoom. So either way, stay tuned. This should be pretty entertaining. So I think the first thing that we want to check out uh, and talk about, Joe, is the Diecast Masters Cat 352 Demolition Excavator, which which is coming pretty soon. What are your thoughts on it? It's absolutely living up to the hype that was kind of generated about it. I know the 352 was a very important machine for Caterpillar, not just the demolition version, but the, the regular version as well. Uh, some of the dirt guys are a little upset that we're, <laughs> we're getting the demo version, but I'm pretty happy to see it. Uh, even though the real machine, I believe it's mostly in Europe right now, they did bring a prototype to, I think, the demolition show in Texas uh, last year. Yeah. It is It is a pretty cool looking model. I love the fact that you can change the booms and everything. Uh, the fact that they use screws for the interchangeable parts, though, is a little interesting. Um, I know other companies that have done demolition machines in the past either use like some sort of pin, but, you know, not complaining about the the feature being there. Yeah, no, not not at all. And I love the fact that we're going to have a bunch of opening compartments on it. You can kind of see it there in that picture with the, with the hinges. And uh, I know that there's been some comments made about maybe the hinges on the model. I, me personally, I don't think it detracts from it that much. And obviously, you can slap some cat paint on there uh, for those that you know are. are really particular about it. I would like to know, and I don't know at this point, if the if the whole undercarriage, the tracks kind of extend outward. Um, I think that would be really, really cool. But overall, it's it's a pretty awesome looking model. I've been told that they they, they are supposed to extend, at least on one of the one of the posts. So as as we stand right now, I think at this point this will probably be the most highly anticipated 150 scale cap model that, that we've seen in at least the past handful of years, in my yeah. opinion. It's one of the first times that we've had an actual dedicated demolition model from from a cat licensee. Uh, I think you could see part of that starting with the 375, and then we got the 323 with the uh, concrete processor and the sorting grab. So there's, there's a bit of an emphasis going on towards uh, the specialty machines, I guess, now, which is always great to see. Yeah. So as things stand right now, and obviously everything is subject to change, but uh, we believe that this will probably be available uh, either towards the end of the first quarter or somewhere in the second quarter of 2021. Again, it's a very fluid situation with the ongoing uh, world pandemic, but uh, at the very least, you can expect this available sometime in 2021. So make sure that you get your pre-orders in because I, I personally believe this thing is going to sell like wildfire. Yeah, uh, for, for sure. If, if not for the model itself, uh, you're, you're going to see a lot of customs based off of this thing, or people are going to be getting it for the undercarriage or booms or whatnot, or trying to turn it into a regular 352. So parts market out there, that's going to be something interesting. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's move on to uh, the, the CAT CT660 concrete mixer. So this is interesting for, for a number of, of reasons, and I'm sure Joe will, will hit on this too, but you know, the CT660 has been around since the Norscott days, but now it has a licensed Bridgemaster concrete body on it. And I personally like the choice that they went with with the blue cab. And yeah, I just I think it's gonna make a great addition. And, and it's in the core classics lineup too, which if you're not familiar, these, are, these offer the same level of detail, but at a slightly more affordable cost. Yeah, the 660, that one, unlike the 680 or 681, it's it's a pretty solid casting, uh, not a whole lot of complaints about it. For a Norscott model of its time, it was pretty detailed and it still holds up today, unlike the uh, actual real truck that it's based off of. Yeah, un unfortunately, if again, if you guys are not familiar, the CAT discontinued what they call their on-highway vocational truck program to include the CT681 about a handful of years or so ago, but we still are getting models of it, which is great. And you, at least around me, you still see these, you know, on the highways and, and roads around. So it'll be a nice casting. I'm excited to get it. And 
again, I think with the customizers out there, it'll be a pretty easy disassemble and, and easy to res respray these and paint them in, co in uh, custom colors for sure. Yeah, it would be pretty cool if uh, they eventually do almost like a customizer special where they have some some sort of white cab or like white barrel or really basic simple color that would sell by the case. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and and you and they they did do that with the I think it's a Kenworth, um, but I could be wrong with the with the first iteration of the Bridgemaster concrete mixer. That's all white. The drum is white. The cab is white. And uh, that that has sold very very well. Yeah, I kind of feel like the uh, the transport series is something Diecast Masters is putting a lot into. But you know, since they're they've shown that they're willing to sell bits and pieces uh, separately, like the different trailers and whatnot, it it's really up to customer discretion or you know building your own fleet and kind of having having the freedom to pick and choose. So that's pretty cool open ended way to do it, I guess. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, dropping a little Easter egg here, I think that there's probably going to be um, a lot more to come from Diecast Masters in the Transport Series line uh, in the immediate future. So a lot to be a lot to be excited about, a lot to look forward to if uh, if you're a fan of the Transport Series for sure. All righty, want to get on to the uh, 187 D11? Oh, you know me. If it's 187 <laughs> scale, I'm all in. All right, so here we have the new D11 in 187 scale diecast uh, Highline series. So it'll come into tin. And I believe this is the, the TKN version, which is the newer version that was produced in 150th scale. Unfortunately, we're not getting metal tracks on this release, but at the same same time, it also means we're getting a less expensive release. So the mining collectors out there are fleet builders you know you're you're going to be able to get a good number of these for a pretty decent price tag and it's always good to see a uh, large dozer in the scale uh, last one we got was the d9t quite a number of years ago so always good to see uh investment and in new castings here right and when norse got originally did the d9t um it got what was it 2000 2011 2010 so yeah that it's sounds you, about right you're talking 11 you know 10 11 yep. years ago so obviously the d11 is the biggest dozer in the cat range so it's going to be substantially larger than the d9 and you know you touched on it joe about the fact that yeah it doesn't come with with metal tracks but i think that there will be uh maybe an option made by by somebody other than diecast masters that that might produce a set of metal tracks that you can buy you know kind of in the aftermarket world so don't let that detract you from it i think it looks good if you look at the tracks there's there's actually some detail on them as they stand right now and again in, in ho scale it's substantially smaller than than 150 scale overall i think it looks really really good i'm very excited i'm really pleased that they were able to get the visibility perforations on the spill guard even in this scale and there and joe's pulling up a great picture right now of the difference between a d9t and then the prototype of the D11, you can just see, you know, it's it's a couple notches above in terms of scale. So really, really looking forward to it. Again, you can expect these within the next few months, hopefully. And uh, I could probably Joe will too, but I definitely will have a review of both of the upcoming 187 scale diecast masters models that we're going to touch on here. Right. So the D11, you know, it's one heck of a big machine, you know, in, in the relative scale of things, and it, it's just plain exciting to see this. You're going to have a much bigger dozer and 187 scale for, you know, diecast master's price and not other manufacturers out there that make a much more expensive dozer. So this will fit the bill for a lot of collectors and, you know, satisfy that craving for a large dozer. That's an excellent point. You know, previously, if you wanted a D11 in, uh, in 187 or HO scale, I believe your only option was, you know, a brass model by another manufacturer. And you're talking well over a thousand dollars in today's money. Um, so this this will be an excellent alternative for those that you know want to build up a mining diorama for their train layout or just have an example of Cat's largest dozer in in a more reasonable scale. Um, so that's that's an excellent point. You know, it'd be actually interesting if they uh, put three or four of these or two even two of these together in a little box set with a the site trailer and call it the command for dozing set. They they should have you on their marketing team. I'm just saying. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's that's one of the things they were trying to sell in the last couple of years with the D11s or D11 and some of their other large dozers is you can technically link them all together and operate them from one one spot for those more uh, 
either more mundane or riskier sites that require remote operation. Right. And obviously you can do a couple variations of this too, whether you, you put a carry dozer setup on it, change out the number of ripper shanks, maybe even do an all mining white version. So lots of different opportunities I can see for this casting uh, potentially if they, you know, if, if the first run sells really well, if it's pretty well received by not only the HO model railroad community, but also die cast collectors. Um, I, I personally um, love obviously the HO scale lineup of models and I really want to see these do well so that we can have more diecast masters cap models in 187 scale. Uh, well said there. Um, so the other 187 scale caterpillar piece that we talked about touched on earlier. Here's the new 336. Yeah, so this is going to be the, the 336 next generation design with the modern hex logo. Uh, once again, it has the, the rubber tracks, which as you can see are done in the similar style of kind of the 320 tracks, but obviously it's a, it's a larger excavator. Um, I, I really do think because it's going to be mounted by, you know, a, a screw, I think it's going to be really easy for the customizers out there to make a replacement undercarriage with track set for this uh, somewhere down the road. And honestly, the way it looks now in 187 scale, I think it's I, I think it looks pretty good, but it I definitely can be improved with maybe some some metal tracks or some 3D printed tracks on it. Uh, but the functionality I think is going to be really the the telltale of how well this model is is going to do once it comes out. Definitely, uh, the 336 it does have absolute advantages over the last round 30 metric ton machine we got in 187 scale, which believe it or not, I think that was the CX-330 by, uh, by Norris Scott, the case machine. And we all know that one wasn't, wasn't the greatest for uh, as far as aging. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, what's the saying? It, that didn't age well. Yeah. Aged like uh, whole milk, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, as you can yeah. see this, you know, this has a pretty good size bucket on it as well. And um, there, you know, there's a three, if you guys are not familiar, which most of you guys are, uh, there's a 3D printing website out there called Shapeways, and they make hydraulic thumbs for HO scale excavators. That's something that you can put on this aftermarket. And with the way the bucket is attached on here, it is not out of the realm of possibility that it can be, be removed and perhaps some other attachments be made for this uh, in the, again, in the aftermarket world. So a lot, a lot of different possibilities with this. I'm once again, extremely excited to, uh, to get mine in and, and do a review for you guys. Yep. The, uh, the tracks going back on those, uh, they're definitely a lot more detailed than the 320 tracks. I know, I know back then they, Norris Scott tried to step up the detail on the rubber tracks a little bit from the 315 to the 320. But, uh, I think those, because of the way they packaged them, they ended up getting all warped because of the twist ties. And that's a great point, Joe. It, with both of these models, if, if we didn't mention, they're going to be in the high line series. So they're going to come in the metal tin. So you're not going to have to worry about pesky twist ties. And uh, also, obviously, because they're in foam rubber, it really negates any issue of, you know, uh, any of the tracks dry rotting or any of that. So uh, once again, great additions to the HO scale collection. Yeah, really, really excited to see these, uh, see these models coming out. And I think we have a picture showing it next to a 320. So there you go. Yeah, almost looks like it's, you know, pretty close to, to twice the size of it. So between the Norscott days and then the Diecast Masters days, there's been so many different 320s or 325s. I mean, CCM did a 325, then Norscott did 320s. There's been a 315, but we haven't seen like a 330 or a 336 in HO scale. So Again, I personally am so looking forward to this, and I can't wait to get it. Yeah, the 35-ish uh, ton range, we'll just call it that, uh, the 336 roughly falls into. That's the real intermediate machine that you, you see basically everywhere. So, you know, the 330, 336D, and now the 336 Next Gen, they're really those machines that are real popular, and you see a lot of contractors using them for a lot of purposes. So it was a, it was a pretty good choice for them. Absolutely agree. So continuing with the 187 scale, here's one that we haven't had a whole lot of information from since I believe last year's Toy Fair. But anyway, it's the, uh, I believe it's the 6060, I want to say. 
yeah, so these are the, the mining excavators and mining front shovels. Um, I don't know what else I can say about these other than I wish they were out now. Um, <laughs> I'm not a patient man. And these look absolutely incredible. I don't have any details on whether, you know, the tracks are going to be rubber on these or whether they're going to be metal. However, if I had to guess, judging by the size that these are compared to like the 330 that we just saw, I don't think it would be out of the realm of possibility for these to actually have metal tracks on them, being that they are HO scale. Yeah, I think on the uh, prototype picture, they look like individual links, but then again, they also teased us with those on the uh, D11. Exactly. So I don't know, but they look, ex this model looks extremely functional. Maybe it has a fold down access stair. Um, you can see all of the different hydraulic connections and hoses that's going to the different pistons. Um, just, just an extremely exciting mining model set. And again, if you wanted something like this in HO scale, at least on the Caterpillar end, prior to this, your only offering was to spend you know, well over $1,500 and, and pick up the brass CCM pieces that were released, I think, in 2013. So uh, this is going to give die cast collectors and, and cat collectors a whole nother alternative to build up their HO scale collection or their mining fleet and make a really cool mining diorama for a very affordable price. Right. And I think the, as far as other, other manufacturers go, I think the only other choice you had was the um, two different, or two different Hitachi EX 8,000s made a couple of years ago. Uh, that model I have a few of them and they're they're pretty nice but i don't think they were exceptionally easy to find either so you're you were ending up paying pretty penny for even a die cast model so you know these might be a notch below that price but definitely nowhere near the price of the the 5230s in brass so it'll be exciting to see and the fact that they offered both a backhoe and a front shovel configuration is always nice to see yeah uh i have been told we can probably expect these if there are no more delays, probably towards the end of this year. Um, so this, you know, kind of hoping for a third, fourth quarter release, which would be great. So if you're excited for these, expect them later on this year. All right. So tangentially related to 187th Nacho scale, we have the 1125th series, which has been added to. Yes. So uh, a few years ago, let me just take a minute to explain this for those that may not be familiar. The 125th scale, the 1 125th scale, rather, uh, this was a lineup that Diecast Masters did. They wanted to showcase some of the largest CAD equipment in a scale that you could put on a desk, uh, literally. And it came in like a flip top packaging and had a base. And the idea was to show some of Cat's largest equipment in a reasonable 1 to 125th elite scale to show some detail. And needless to say, it, it didn't sell as well as many expected or thought that it will. And it wasn't as, how do we say, positively received in the collector's community as maybe some may have thought that it should have. So they, they've changed the branding and the design. And this year, they they do want to continue on with the the series but they're changing it from the 1 to 125th elite series and just kind of going for more of uh, the 1 to 125 series as far as i know and and we're going to see a couple new additions starting off with uh, i believe the 745 articulated dump truck yep interestingly enough the 1 125th scale series originally started as part of the highline with one of the large mining trucks, but I think when they did the 797, I want to say they, and a couple more models, they shifted towards the elite series for whatever reason. And yeah, I, I want to say the, the haul truck was originally offered around the time of toy fair and they almost used it as a promo piece back then so yeah they did it was the 793 f and it actually was the nuremberg toy fair model for for diecast masters i actually have that one and it was the 793 f and uh, i believe the changeover you are correct did occur with the 797 f and then they did the you know the commemorative edition in copper um which is actually a it's, it's a very nice piece that copper finish is very impressive um so this is this is a very niche scale. There's no question about it. 
Uh, in my opinion, here's another great picture that, that Joe's pulled up right now. You cannot use these for HO scale. They will not look correct. There's too much of a size uh, deviation. However, if you are looking to build or start your collection and you just want to collect a small series that has a nice sample size of nearly every piece of equipment that Caterpillar offers, um, the 1 to 125 series is a, is a good option for you. Well said there. Yeah, they're uh, small enough that they basically represent all the biggest machines that you'd possibly want, but they're not, they're not by any means micro machine size. So you still get a decent bit of the functionality and the detail, perhaps not as much as you'd get in HO scale or even 164th or 150th scale, but there's still pretty good representation for a decent somewhat uniform price around all the, the machine sizes. So, so for someone that you just want to get into collecting or want something Caterpillar on their desk, but they don't really know what they want, you know, they could see an application there. Right. And as you can see here with the articulated dump truck too, it, it is a scaled down casting of the 150th, as most of these are, they are scaled down castings of the 150th scale version. And, and you do get kind of that little sand uh, plastic load that you can put in it which is, um, which is kind of nice. So the, the 745 will be the first new one. The second new one will be this, I believe it's a 657G scraper. It is, and it's in the push-pull configuration. So in theory, this would make another great small display. If you wanted to purchase two of these, you can have them set up in a push-pull configuration, which again, if you're not familiar with that, is, a, uh, it, it is really a technique that Caterpillar devised a couple decades ago to more effectively load two scrapers. So you can you know, have two of these on your desk in a push-pull configuration. You can see that the detail is, is pretty decent for as small as these models are. And again, I, I think the scraper in particular, it's one of Kat's largest uh, uh, scrapers. I think the 657 was a good choice. Yeah, it's uh, pretty neat to see that even like the whole bail and loop, the block and all that assembly looks like it's pinned in place so it can move up and down. And you, like you said, can go with the push full configuration. And, you know, that brings in the D11 as well. Uh, would not be out of the realm of possibility to throw one in there for, you know, more power. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, can never have enough power. Yeah. So, it, yeah, these would be uh, pretty cool to have on, on a desk. And now that they're not confined to the flip top box, it would actually be kind of cool to see these bundled with maybe like a little plastic terrain piece or something. Uh, so I could see the 745 below a 390 on the bench or have the two scrapers or a dozer, you know, on a little piece of dirt. That is a great suggestion. Um, we'll just have to see where this line goes and, and, and what ends up happening here. Yep. From a production standpoint, I can get that they, that they thought the older models to scale down would be simpler than maybe going for the the new D11, or even you know now that there's been a design change to the 657, but uh, still cool nonetheless to see these. Yeah, definitely. You guys definitely. While we're going through this, let us know down in the comment section below. You know, leave your yeah. So uh, yeah, leave your suggestions or whatever your comments concerns in the comment section um so we're now departing the 1 125th scale and uh, moving on to something else a little smaller than 150th scale so so these are the uh these are the 164 scale uh playing collect series by diecast masters uh, again something that i've uh reviewed extensively on uh, on my channel diecast emporium these are very inexpensive uh, die cast replicas of cat equipment. They, they really come in two different assortments. I, I like to say there's a large assortment and then a medium sized equipment assortment. The, uh, the slide that you're looking at now, these are the larger scale equipment, the 385, the 775, the 611 and the 988 H. Uh, the medium sized equipment has the two skid steers, uh, the 320, this slide right here, the D6R and the 950 M. You can see that the packaging that they come in, and really the best part of all of these is the fact that they range anywhere from uh, 18 to like $23, I think is the most expensive one. So if you are if you are a diehard 164 scale collector, so if you if you collect trucks in 164 scale, or you know, if you're 
a, a car collector and you want some construction flair, these are an obvious choice for you. The functionality is very good on most of these models and their the durability is is pretty good as well on these because they are designed for a slightly younger demographic than the adult collectors i think these are designed for like eight and up as opposed to the 14 plus that are, most of our other stuff is uh this is you know the, these things are really cool and then at the end of last year 2020 they announced four more additions you had the two cb13 rollers one with an open ROPS, one with an enclosed cab, like you would see in Europe. And then you had this two CT660s, the dump truck and the cement mixer, both with the licensed body. And uh, the CT660 was the first model that they had the licensed OX uh, stampede dump box. And the CT660 was the first model with the McNeilis Bridmaster concrete mixer. So not only did you have a licensed truck, but you also had a licensed body on both of these. Um, and Joe, did you have anything you wanted to say on these 164 scale ones? I know the, the lar at least the larger series, the ones that have been around for a while, these were the series that you could pick up at Walmart, Kmart, or even like a tractor supply or something. I remember, distinctly remember them having the 385 bundled with, I think it was two plastic 187 scale pieces and one or two construction minis for like 25 bucks back at least 10 years ago. So that was, it's kind of like the price factor on these. I think the, they originally were not even $20 a piece. So it was definitely a super affordable series and it continues to be an affordable series even today. So at least something you can get younger collectors into the loop with. Absolutely. And truth be told, large ones are Norris Scott castings. The, the, the medium sized ones, as I referred to them, such as the 950, the D6, those are all scaled down original die cast masters castings. I, I would say probably the best bang for your buck of all of them. The one that I found, if you want to, dare I use the, taboo to term coolest is probably the two skid steers they come in one pack they all have their their own attachments so you get attachments for the the skid steer and the multi-terrain loader and you get both in one set so i i just think these are great value and there will be it's already been announced there there will be additions to the 164 scale product line coming this year we, we have a 320f excavator that will have attachments um uh, there'll be a couple different D11s. One of them is just, you know, going to be your standard D11. And then there's going to be, here they are right here. Uh, this is your standard D11. And then the one underneath it will be a D11T carry dozer. So this will be your carry dozer configuration on here. And uh, then there will be a 950M with a log grapple. So here's the log grapple configuration on it. So you can expect... These to be added to the lineup in 2021 and definitely great additions to the play and collect line as far as I'm concerned. Yep, uh, the D11s, those would be pretty pretty cool to see. Um, I know we were supposed to have a D11, uh, but it was 163rd scale as part of the fail, not failed, but that's kind of a strong word, but the, the short-lived uh, toy state attempt at one sixty fourth ish or yeah one sixty fourth ish h o ish um, diecast caterpillar so this is uh, definitely a whole lot better than uh, that attempt. Oh yeah, I mean that's um, it's fair to bring it up. In my opinion, I don't I don't, I don't think it's a fair comparison at all. Uh, those toy states were definitely marketed as. Uh, definitely toys. These are these are going to be scale models for sure. And that I, I own that 163 scale D11, and that thing is just hideous <laughs> on so many different levels. <laughs> um, these clearly are going to have functional blades, rubber tracks. You can see the different um, details, such as the fire suppression system, the ripper, all the cab guard protection that's on these. And at 164 scale, this is going to be a, a pretty big model in one in 164 scale so i i'm in i would like to see a finished sample i don't know how soon these are going to be available obviously you know the the ongoing world situation has really delayed a lot of things so whenever it gets done when we finally see it i do believe that it will be worth the wait absolutely you know looking back at the the d11 for a couple of seconds now and i'm starting to get the the memories of back when you could get the 150th uh north scott d11r for not a whole lot of money so i had one of those growing up and it's uh moved its fair share of dirt so you know 
kind of got that connection here with this uh, 164 D11. Yeah, yeah, I I also have one of those, and it does kind of give off that uh, that sense of nostalgia with the D11R with you know with a rubber with a rubber track feel to it. So it'll be interesting to see knowing what those 150 scales retailed for back in the day, what the price deviation will be for a D11 and 164 scale today. Yep. Anyway, uh, continuing with 164 scale, we got all this equipment, so you got to haul it somehow. So um, some of the newer 164 releases that are upcoming that I'm more fond of are uh, the Mac Superliner with the Talbert Lowboy from first gear. So we finally got a Superliner in scale. Now, if we can somehow push or nudge them to make them 150 at scale version, that would be perfect. But, you know, I might end up getting one of these to go with uh, some of those upcoming our current diecast masters 164th scale construction pieces so here's one in red and silver and then you got one white and blue so oh that white and blue one looks yeah. really really sharp yep now do the the bed the outrigger extensions do they work on these low boys in 164 scale you know, I haven't held one of the actual Talbert ones uh, in my hands. I haven't had one, but I did have the DCP, uh, I think it was a Fontaine Magnitude. Those ones worked, but I think I don't particularly remember on on the Talbert, but I think these ones might be fixed. Okay. Yeah. And that's something, too, that, you know, you might want to touch on, too, Joe, is the the recent kind of changeover for, for first gear the way they're marketing their 164 scale brand kind of going away from first gear and integrating it into DCP. You want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So I think it was in the last couple of years, um, first gear bought out or did a merger with diecast promotions and DCP or diecast promotions was one of those companies that was real appeal for those uh, 164 scale truck collectors. So it did special runs or work with dealers to get their own special runs and, you know, there were a lot of different truck and trailer combinations out there. And at the same time, First Gear was marketing their 164 scale models as well. So, you know, there's a lot of combined expertise in that area. It's interesting to see the two join forces, so to speak. Yeah, very well said. So what this allows for, I guess, is um, smaller dealers to put in their own orders with specialty uh paint schemes and you know add add a whole lot to the market so i'm not a huge 164 scale collector but if it's cool enough you know i just happen to go for things so adding that amount to the market and allowing smaller time dealers their kind of leverage in the market is uh really cool to see agreed um and, and definitely you're the expert on this product line for sure but doesn't first gear if i'm if i'm not mistaken don't they offer a couple 164 scale construction equipments that you can put on the back of these oh absolutely so they have a couple komatsu pieces i think it's a pc 210 lc and a d155 but those ones a little more expensive than the diecast masters ones but if you absolutely have to have metal tracks you have your pick there all right well covered yep. what else does first gear have coming up well Currently, I believe these have been shipped. I got mine uh, in the other day. They have the East Genesis dump trailers, the frameless dump. And here's just the one that I'll be reviewing uh, is the version with the time-honored Matt Granite tractor. Uh, they also offer a T880. Uh, so there's a good few number of paint variations on those. And they've also started offering the Mac Granite tractor as a standalone item. So as you've seen, there's the white version, a yellow version, and a red version of the Mac Granite tractor. Uh, so that, that brings a lot of memories back. Um, I think I managed to grab the last all-white uh, Mac Granite from 3000 Toys maybe like 10 years ago when they were offering those. So seeing them again is bringing back a lot of good memories. Wow. Yeah, I, I know that I have a, a red one in my collection um, and an orange one, both of which came with the low boy sets that they offered at, you know, as you mentioned, a, a number of years ago. Are, are they basically going to be the same tooling with just updated liveries and paint schemes, or has there been any, any changes to your uh, to your knowledge? As far as I know, I think they're kept as is. Um, you know, granite is one of those designs that really hasn't changed cosmetically. I mean, under the hood, you know, with all the new emissions and electronics, obviously it's changed. 
um, seeing like the M drive transmissions and that sort of thing. But, you know, as far as an external view of a model, it's, it's pretty similar, just updated, updated paint, new paint, um, different combinations. And now that you bring up the low boys as well, uh, they're offering the low boys, the Talbot low boys with the, uh, Matt granites once again. So a lot of, a lot of nostalgia there. Um, it's great to see more transport for all that equipment that's coming out. For sure. Um, can you touch a little bit more on, and, and I know you said that you're going to do it on your channel extensively, uh, the whole set, but can you tell us a little bit in this video, kind of give us a preview of the trailer itself? Oh, and here's the, uh, here's the other, um, one other version of the Mac Granite. And you can also get the, the trailer in Chrome as well. It's opposed to the silver. So the trailer itself, it, I'm happy to report, is a very solidly made die cast uh, casting. You know, it has an intricate little latch on the back to open the, the I think it's a sand chute and um, open the door on the back. It's a barn door kind of set up so it doesn't swing up, it swings outward. Um, so there is a, I believe it's a three-stage cylinder that raises the trailer. So it's a frameless trailer. So it has a hinge partway through, counteracts the cylinder and lets the, the actual body go up. It is a, like I said, it's a solid piece of uh, the dump height. It does the job, but first gear is talking about producing the next run with potentially higher uh, extension on that. So it is a pretty good trailer to see. And uh, for the price point that they're offering, don't have a whole lot of, um, complaints to it it's just it's good to see something more affordable than the the other east trailers that were put out by uh sword i want to say so if you're building a truck fleet you know this would be a definite option to look at yeah and uh i i think from the pictures and you can definitely verify this for the viewers i, I think there's even like a small asphalt chute on the back that yes is there is there is and it's got a little little tiny latch that you can uh, pull up on the, the the lever, and it goes up. You know, pretty pretty neat. Very cool, very cool. And like we said earlier, uh, this also comes with. You can also get this with a uh, Kenworth T eight eighty, so you can choose between the Mac or the Kenworth, uh, depending on what you prefer. You know, it would be interesting to see these later on if they even have that. Uh, the, Peterbilt casting still, but uh, yeah, uh, might be dating ourselves there, bringing that one up. <laughs> yeah. When did we get old? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right. What do we have next? So what are some of the new models that we're, we're really looking to see get released? Well, I think probably the, one of the most highly anticipated things that, that I would like to talk about that we haven't touched on is uh, the, the couple new CCM models that have been announced, talking specifically about maybe the, the new scrapers that are coming up and uh, the new 988s that are coming up. Yep. Oh, so we... we'll start with we'll start with the scrapers. Here we go. Yep. So we have a 633D elevating scraper. Um, we also have variation of the same kind of machine frame with the rear engine, the 639D. You know, really like the Bloxy or Pac-Man logo era machines, you know, that was kind of just Caterpillar at their best doing their thing. And yeah, these models, they look pretty nice. Um, I think what people were upset about was that the elevating scraper wasn't going to work. But when you're working at this kind of scale, I mean, just look at those little chain links there, you know, that, that gets pretty difficult. Yes. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that you pointed that out immediately. Um, you know, the, the brass one that I have, which I also, which I believe is also a 633 in, in 187 scale, it might be a 633E, um, that also does not work. But honestly, it doesn't detract at all from the intricate detail and just how good it looks in the display case or sitting on a shelf. And I think you're going to see that with these as well. And honestly, from where I'm sitting, I'd rather have something be static and be more robust and have it, you know, lesser the chance of anything breaking then, you know, have it be functional. Because if it's functional, you're going to chip things and move paint anyway on something like this. And again, if it's in the display case or on a shelf, it's not going to be moving anyway. You're not going to take this out and do some gardening work with it. Um, at least most of us wouldn't. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I think it was a very wise design move. And I, I don't personally, I don't have an issue with it whatsoever. Right. I mean, in terms of detail and everything, we're absolutely 
way past that just continuous rubber belt that we got on the uh, Norscott iteration of an elevating scraper. All right. And you can see here, um, I think, you know, forgive me, I, I think Joe touched on this already, but obviously this one and the, this one is not the twin engine version. The other one does have, uh, yep. you know, engine in the front, engine in the rear. Uh, I believe these are going to retail for, what are they, like 460 and 430 for the other one, something like that, 440, 460, something in there, which is not, you know, an inconsiderable amount of money. It's, they're, they're very, very expensive, but I believe that uh, it, whichever one you decide to purchase, or if you decide to purchase both, I think it's going to sell very well. And as we see most often with, with CCM models, most likely it will sell out directly from them probably within a couple of weeks. Yep. So I guess we're at that point where we bring up price and everything. And, you know, I was working on the review for the D11 and, you know, I have the impact ripper version and, you know, it was not, it was the price that was 299.95. That's like Tommy said, it's not an inconsiderable amount of money. It's uh, pretty noticeable, but when you look back at the history of CCM models and developments, uh, I think the original D10, they came out well over 10 years now that was about $190 and then the update they came out when they went to the twin stacks I believe around five years ago was 249 and then now we look at the D11N with a lot of more new casting because the D11N I'll touch on that in my review but it may be an upgrade to the D10 but it is in very many ways a different machine so that entails new casting new investment and with the limited production runs that's that's got to incur a pretty hefty price at the end so the prices aren't from an economical standpoint they're not unfounded but there are it's a pretty it's a pretty tough pill to swallow when you're when your invoice for these comes in yeah i couldn't agree more and that's very well said and what i think most people understand and, and if there's some out there that don't understand these models are not mass produced like you would see from other die cast manufacturers so the initial tooling is a lot more expensive when you have a limited edition model so the therein your 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 cost and your you know your your roe is a lot the the gap is so much smaller when you have to recuperate that in a limited production run versus you know models that are made 10,000 of each. So right. that's important to keep in mind. So for diecast masters on their uh, D11s, they have the span of years and years until they're told to stop producing that model to, to, to get that back. But when CCM put out their D11s, they basically had that uh, a matter of months at best, I guess, try and get that back because they got their limited stock to sell. Right. And again, you have to deal with also different licensees and there's money involved with that. So there, yes, they're, they are expensive, but bear in mind that when you're talking about other businesses, the, the profit margin is relatively small when you look at, you know, take furniture, for example, the, the profit, the gap there is so huge, it's not even funny. So I know we're kind of comparing apples to oranges, but I just want people to realize, you know, when they, when they talk about this and they see these and I get the comments and questions all the time, why is CCM so expensive? It's ridiculous. Well, maybe now you have a little bit more insight as to what's actually going on. Right. So anyway, keeping the ball rolling, we got uh, two more scrapers. We got the 651E, you know, the single engine version. And when you need more power, you got the 657E with the uh, two engines, one in the front and one in the rear. So you know, this is um, this was the big machine that replaced the triple six series. So you know, seeing CCM slowly progressing through the years and going down that lineage of machines, like we saw with the D10 going up to the D11N, and now we see a similar thing with the scrapers, uh, the 660 and the triple six series eventually going into the 657 uh, in the 651. Here we are with the 657 and the 651. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we, it's safe to say this because we see it every single time that there's a scraper released. Uh, it's likely that the 657E will be the first one to sell out because you have those collectors that will buy two of them uh, just to have the push-pull set up. So if you, if you are considering buying either one of these or pre-ordering them, 
you probably want to get that done rather quickly. And even with uh, other models like the D, I think the D nine L, the push cat. Um, um, let me check before where I get this screwed up, but um, they offered a push cat version of the D nine L, and yeah, that is the version that managed to uh, outsell the version with the blade and the triple shank ripper. So. Right. There's a definite market out there for scrapers. You know, a lot of guys out west, um, west of the Mississippi, will tell you that's the only way to move bulk earth. Um, you know, that doesn't work around here. You got things like little tiny pebbles to deal with, uh, <laughs> pebbles that uh, are very expensive and inconvenient to deal with. But you know, going going off of that, um, also got the new 988 Bs. So we have a beadless tire version, which was basically caterpillars um answer to really bad quarry floors you know it was the forerunner of chains and that kind of and solid tires so we got the beadless version just like we got on the 992c and the 992 um so yeah there's there's that and we have a standard version with the standard tires and it's important to note um as of the taping of, of this video, we don't know what the prices are going to be for the 657 or the six, you know, 661s or these loaders yet. They have not been announced. So we have no idea what they're going to be. Yeah. And even for the next one that we're going to talk about, the 350, we have no idea either. So um, CCM, they are producing quite a backlog for themselves. Um, granted, announcing new models helps with uh, customer engagement, but you're also seeing a lot of frustrated collectors um really trying to really having to pick and choose and uh you know ration out what they want to spend or what they want to get and it's it's getting frustrating because when you have a model that is of a fixed production line you end up dealing with stuff that sells out you know becomes closed editions very quickly and then you wind up with uh you also end up dealing with the uh, secondary market driving things up pretty quickly. So it is very frustrating for collectors to try and try and save up for things and then just see another, another nice, exciting model come out right after that. And you, you just got to pick and choose. Yeah. And to, again, to address the elephant in the room, we're both Joe and I, I mean, we're, we are collectors at heart. We spend, I don't even know, godly amounts of money, we, we, between the two of us, we probably have well over 40 years, 40, 45 years invested in the hobby together. And it is extremely frustrating and infuriating when multiple releases, and, and I'm not just saying this is, this is by CCM. There are, there are other companies that do this, but it seems like multiple pre-order releases tend to come in at exactly the same time. And for me, I, I, I'm no business expert but I really wish things would be spread out more so it would give the collector the ability to be able to more substantially afford things as they are more spread out. And a perfect example of this was you had, you know, a couple years ago or whatever, you had all the 375s came out at the exact same time. And then there was another model that came out. Maybe it was the D9, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. There was another run of CCM models that came out at exactly the same time. And a lot of collectors had to pick and choose. Whereas if it was spread out, we could have got all the 375s and all the next model. Um, and it, the, the issue is, and this is not a CCM issue. This is a aftermarket problem is if you don't purchase them when they come out, you're then forced to pay two, three, four times as much on the secondary market when you can afford them uh, if you if you want to get them. And ultimately that leaves us, leaves some collectors um, out of luck because you, yeah. you you just you can't afford a, a three hundred dollar model that's now a a thousand dollar or a twelve hundred dollar model. And again, that is that is not a CCM problem. That is just I, I guess you know the aftermarket issue as I like to address it. But if things were more planned out and if things were more sporadically released throughout the year in a timely and more organized structure, I think that would be a much much better way to go about doing things. Joe, do you have any further thoughts on that? Um, I think about the, the whole aftermarket issue. What comes to mind is what in the world happened to the D9H models. So that was a CCM model that originally actually got rejected when it got shipped to um, 
shipped to the headquarters for uh, unpacking. There were widespread issues with paint and quality. So that actually, that run was, I think it was actually returned and they had to have the issues corrected. Um, so that, that was a model that we see that I think it, it wasn't even before I get this wrong again. Um, I want to say it was not quite shy of um, 200 initially, the, the release price. And then you see them for three, four times that nowadays. Um, but I think with all these releases as well, it's also hitting the, uh, the resellers too, um, because there's just so much infinitely more product that they got to keep track of um, that CCM is pushing out that now you see models that just kind of sit on eBay because they, uh, they're they still available from a number of sources or there's just too many out there. So I think it might have ended up being a self-addressing problem, but it is uh, it was frustrating to see some versions of the models sell out a lot quicker than others or whatnot. Yeah. Artificially. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, officially. <laughs> I, I And I think, and maybe I'm the minority in this, but... It didn't – when this first started, when, when the CCM diecast stuff really first started, you didn't have three or four different variations of every specific model. And I think there's – some models, there's a need for it, but I don't think every specific casting that they release, there needs to be multiple versions of it. Again, I could be in the minority of it. Um, let me know what you guys, the viewers, think down in the comments section below. But I almost think it would add value and, and add prestige if we could just have one specific model made of whatever they're doing. So, uh, again, Joe, maybe you can elaborate on that too and give your opinion. But I just I don't think it's necessary to have – I understand it from a business point. Let me be clear. I, I completely – and I would do the same thing if I was them. Let me be clear. But I just don't think it's – I, I don't think it's necessary on every single release. Yeah, I, part of the whole process researching the D11 and, and everything is I looked at the production numbers and it seemed, I think it was like four, three, four, five hundred here and there with different versions, whatnot. And across the four versions, it added up to 2,000 pieces, which interestingly enough, we look back at the original D10 over a decade ago. They offered, I think it was a thousand each of the standard version and around a thousand each of the um the push cad version so i'm thinking originally they offered maybe two or three variations and they they all added up to being a certain number that they a target number that they wanted to produce of the model but now what we're getting is instead of just dividing it into two or three variations or different variations over several waves throughout the years um so there's some kind of shift that they just want to push them all out at once, but have more variations with slightly lower production numbers. Exactly. And I, I just, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that either way. I just, I, I understand it from their standpoint. I completely get it. I just, I'm not sure long-term if that's going to be a sustainable way to do things, but you know, to each yeah. their own. I think they're trying to avoid um, models that just sit as an open edition, not a closed edition for almost forever. So we got, let's check a look, take a look at the available models and kind of scroll down. And I guess some of the, the models that had several releases or just two releases at a time, they usually one model sells two or three releases usually one model sells out and the other one just kind of sits so right. I think they wanted to get away from that by offering more versions and fewer numbers to try and get that ratio evened out by memory i don't have the screen in front of me obviously i'm looking at whatever everybody else is looking at which is the 988 but i think the triple seven g both haul trucks, the, the the haul truck and the water truck, I think that's still available. I think all of the 637K scrapers, maybe two, at least two or three of them are still available. Um, obviously, the brass 349F excavator, which, by the way, fantastic model. Absolutely buy it if you can. Um, 
I, I, you know, I think those are still available and maybe some, I don't know, Joe, maybe the D nine H one of them is still the D nine L is still available. And then the D nine G with the, the rip blade is still available. So I think those were the last two models that they only released uh, two variations of. So okay. usually one sell, one sells out and the other one just kind of, kind of hangs around for a little while. Okay. Yeah. That so makes sense. Perhaps that's what they saw and they just tried to, uh, tried to make it tried to tried to make their chances uh larger of them having something sell out by making smaller numbers and just more variations all right so we've touched on the loaders we've touched on the scrapers what's next uh the three 350l and the 350 lme so right. the 375 is uh, little brother direct little brother um ignoring all the rest of the original 300 series because those had different body work but yeah so i mean i don't know how you felt joe but i i kind of am pretty excited for these um i've really always wanted a 350 excavator and i probably will get the um again depending on financial situation at the right. time but i i probably will get this version the standard version the 350l yeah um, I think it looks pretty good. Again, we have no idea on pricing yet. I, I'm hoping that I'm hoping for like a $270 range. I think that's, I, I hope it would not be any more than that. Yeah. Because you're with that price, you're basically paying for another 375. Um, right. Right. And, and maybe, maybe it will be a little bit less because that's a 375 price and this is a 350. I don't know. I have no yeah, idea. We really don't know. Cause uh, we, we can't really apply that logic because the D9L, the updated version um, almost two years ago, that was 219 as well. And or 219.95. And then the D7Gs, which just came out, those smaller machine, but same price. And so it's uh, a little interesting, you know? Right. And again, applying what I said earlier, I, Again, personal opinion. I'm very happy that there's only two versions of this, whereas right. there were four versions of the 375. <laughs> so. Yeah, somewhere around there. It's like, it, it's good to see that they go for a more standard approach um, on on the supposed standard 350. Um, I mean, I wasn't averse to the long and long stick, uh, long stick, long boom configuration on the 375. I mean, that's kind of what we saw around here for. Uh, machines doing like deep foundation work you know reaching down and down into a hole and all that but uh a lot of collectors around the world and um in other places that don't have that kind of configuration were a little bit upset about that so i guess a return to a more standard model is uh neat to see yeah and I, i'm not up on i haven't done the research but i don't know when the you know the 350 was originally released to the market i'm guessing somewhere in the 90s mid 90s maybe? just about yeah Okay. Yeah. So it'd be nice to have another machine from that era. That's yeah. kind of when I was a kid and grew up. So these were very frequent in Western New York. I, I distinctly remember multiple job sites with 350s yeah. around. Yeah. As much as there was a uh, hate these days for the 350 in the uh, earth moving world. I mean, it, back in that day, up until the early 2000s, every single major contractor here up until the 345B came out and the 365, they had to have a 375 and the 350 for their, for the big cat machines. So a lot of a lot of Boston was, uh, especially during the, the tail end of the big dig era, the big huge, huge federally funded expensive project. A lot of that was dug out with uh, cat machines just like this. So, yeah, getting getting those memories out. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yep. So I, from what I'm being told. Um, from a source that I'm not going to get into a whole lot of, uh, they're, they're taking their time on this one after what happened with the 375 models. So um, the usual turnaround point for a CCM model is anywhere from 12 months to like a year and a half, two years. So these were announced, uh, I think, March of 2018 20. or it was it 18 or 19. Uh, I think it was, I, I thought it was last year. I don't know. The years go together. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're getting up to that uh, that point in time, so yeah, uh, would not be super super surprised to see a prototype come up um, within the next couple of months. Uh, obviously, depending on everything that's going on in the world right now, but yeah, I'm with Joe. 100% agree. Take your time. No need to rush yep. anything. 
yeah we got we got enough to pay for right now uh <laughs> yes slow the slow the break slow the roll a little bit uh we'll be waiting <laughs> slow the spread <laughs> oh boy okay um now we got the uh the 60 30s and 148 scale uh again no price r- released yet very big sizable models you know the looking at a couple steps below the 60 90 uh, in terms of size and here we have another model that's just two variations the uh backhoe and the front shovel you know i don't really see a third variation being necessary on a model like this uh, i think anything else that you would want in this size would have to be a custom product so that would yeah sorry i had to pick my tongue off the floor of just drooling at, at <sighs> the gargantuan gorgeousness yeah. of this of these two models uh yeah i um yes i have a pre-order yeah. in for both of these um i will be reviewing them the second that uh I eagerly rip open the box and have these on my review table. Um, I like the fact that they opted to go with the the new trade dress with the with with the cat graphics. I think that's a that's a wise choice, and I I, I think it's I think it's going to be another fantastic mining model by CCM. The only issue that I have personally is uh, I got to find another display case big yeah. enough to house these. <laughs> between then and now yeah um but half half of the collectors out there just disagreed with you on the on the hex graphics oh i think it's oh i think it's probably more than half but it's growing growing on me it it really is and honestly i really kind of you know no pun intended but i kind of dug it from the beginning i just i like it and the only logo that i never really liked was uh or, I, I mean, I like all of them, but I never really liked the wavy original Caterpillar. Like, I, I just, I never really was big on that. The uh, the red one? Yeah, the red wavy one. I, I mean, because just... the company photographer was like, that looks like a Caterpillar crawling. And they're like, aha, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> aha. Write this down. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Um, the 60s, 30s, they're, they're impressive. But the issues that people have brought up were the hex graphics and it's fallen victim to the same issue with the tracks as the 6090 is that they're basically as as shown as drawn as built on the uh on the cad drawings that they were given so they're uh they're, they're it's not quite the the pattern you would see on the real track shoe on the 6030 or a 6090 but yeah hopefully they they can address that one well, if they and, and if they can't, I'm sure there's aftermarket companies out there that will, you know, come out with a replacement. Yeah, I bet uh, the bet the guy over there in y, at YCC is like, please don't fix it, please don't fix it, please don't yes, fix it. Yes, that's that's exactly what I was thinking of in my head. That's that's yeah. exactly who I was thinking of. Yep. I mean, but I mean, yeah. if you look past all that, um, I know people that missed out missed out on the original missed out on the original, you know, CCM mining backhoe or, or whatever the front shovel that came out a couple of years ago, 2018. And they're, they're not willing or they're, yeah. they're not willing or they're not able to, to pay the, the premium that they're at yep. now. Um, they, you have this one coming. So yeah. there's that. And even going back in the lineage of where these machines came from, if you missed out on the Brahmi R- ONK or Terex ONK RH340, here's your chance again at a similar machine. I mean, it's a little smaller, but here's your chance. Um, yeah. <laughs> Here's now, your we, hand. Again, we, we don't have any idea of pricing or release dates for these, but because this is a finished prototype, completely finished, uh, I would it would not surprise me in the next couple, three to four months. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Again, it, I'm kind of kind of anticipating, but also kind of kind of hoping things get pushed a little bit so I can maybe afford this thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, exiting the uh, massive caterpillar that we just let out of the bag. Um, here's something on the absolute opposite side for your smallest of small jobs. Got the little Vermeer mini skid loader, the CTX 100. Yeah, how cool are these cast. two? I mean, starting off with the with. Yeah, how cool are these two little things? I mean, these kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, was not expecting something this small to come out. I know Speccast did do the the horizontal um yeah, the horizontal drill from uh Vermeer in 164 scale, which was kind of odd. 
last year, but I was not expecting for these to come out in 150th scale. You know, fortunately they chose this scale because it's something this small, they usually do it in like either 125th or 116th scale, like the uh, snow blowers that TWH did or the yeah. mowers that first gear is doing. Now, I'm not up on, on the real versions of this, but is this the one that's operated while you're standing up? Yes, it's a stand-up uh, skid loader. So you're on the back and the little joysticks. Uh, so this would be uh, for your, your landscape jobs or, you know, you could, I think you can even rent one of these at Home Depots or, you know, it would be for putting in, putting in the patios, but you don't really want to do all the shoveling work yourself or that kind of thing. And these are, and, and this is probably substantially smaller than like the, the Diecast Masters multi-terrain loader. Oh, absolutely. Scale, this correct? would be something to, to pair with the, uh, I can never get the number right on that one, but it's the uh, three on one. Yeah. 0.7. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So the, yeah, uh, you That'd would be a cool pair. You'd pair these up and, you know, it would not be out of the realm of possibility to have these do an interior demo. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. Yep. So we uh, we can say now that because we're recording this uh, on a Sunday that these actually have been started started to be delivered to the dealers. So these yep. these should be available right now as you're watching this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm awaiting my invoice on these currently from Titan Diecast. Um, so you can get these there. You can have 3,000 toys. Uh, really, a lot of your preferred dealers should be getting these in stock. Um, yeah. Yeah, constructiondiecast.com, the construction diecast store, Ed's diecast shed, all of them should carry these. Uh, my question is, and I again, I'm not up on this this type of equipment, but if we transition to the next slide with the wood chipper, yep. just how big is this wood chipper? Meaning, would you put this behind like a pickup truck or a proper you know wood chip truck? Just how big is this little BC 1000 XL chipper? Oh, you would you would put it behind the pickup truck, I think. Um... Yeah, Nick over at Titan Diecast got that question last night, and he posted it behind one of the new newer first gear pickup trucks. So okay, it would not be you know you could probably have one of these behind a um, uh, bucket truck or a chip truck as well, you know. Uh, but yeah, they're pretty pretty neat little models and everything. The uh, the tailgate part or the part that prevents your prevents things from going into the chipper when you're in transport that that goes up as well and closes up nicely so yeah yeah it so. looks like a it looks like a pretty functional model uh me just being me and nitpicking I, I kind of found it odd that they they posted a picture with a chip that if you look at the bottom of the red piece it's, it has a couple paint chips yeah. on it <laughs> <laughs> but uh no it looks it looks like a pretty cool trailer and uh as joe said you could put it behind a pickup truck or maybe you know a, a chip truck whatever so it looks pretty interesting yeah, uh, maybe maybe this will uh, bring make someone out there decide to make one of those uh, bucket trucks specifically for uh, they call it tree surgery or tree removal that kind of deal and pair these up. Well, we know of one manufacturer that makes them in larger scales, so maybe this might be the push that uh, that makes them you know go down to one fifty scale. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know some of these some of these manufacturers are somewhat friendly, at least when it comes to like marketing and stuff. So you could you could deal that deal with that, hopefully. Because I, if I if I remember correctly, they're all in the same general geographic area, so it's not out of the realm of possibility for collaboration or something. Because I think the uh, the two manufacturers we have in mind, they don't have a whole lot of uh, conflict of interest or overlapping product lines. Yeah, certainly will be interested interested to see what actually is functional on this. Um, I'm I'm just looking at it right now, like that rubber piece in the back yeah. that looks like it might move a little bit. It does uh, look pretty flexible. Yes, it, it looks like uh, you can hook this up with the. It looks like it even comes with a little hitch that yep. you can take out. And um, it looks like the jack stand is a screw discharge. too. Yeah, and it looks like yeah. the discharge. What do you call that shoot that looks like that turns. Yeah, hopefully. Or it says Vermeer. Yep. Uh, and I'm, on, I'm, my mind's drifting, and I'm just thinking of all the little one fiftieth scale workplace accidents that could occur. <laughs> uh yeah, yeah, that yeah. would, um, that would not, <laughs> that would not turn out very well. I don't think. No. 
because uh, I was on the, um, the the Rural King website the other day um, looking for their, the Bruder stuff they have on sale. And um, it's part of the Bruder World Series. They have, a, they have an emergency, uh, emergency care unit one. So <laughs> yeah, there are things are getting interesting. I didn't know you did Bruder. That's pretty cool. Um, I mostly stockpile them as they come on sale so I can uh, eventually put all the motors and everything in them. Ah, whenever I, I get any kind of time to deal with that. But yeah. Interesting. Was, you bring up yep. motorizing brooder stuff. We, should we touch on that before we end the video? Yeah. So yeah, we can do that. Um, so there are, there is a little bit of a community out there because, because we touched on RC construction equipment somewhat. We might've, or we could have, we might've done that before we actually started recording, but um, between the diecast master stuff and the hoyness stuff and all the less expensive items that maybe top out at hundred to a couple hundred dollars at most, um, those are still considered to be on, you know, the introductory toy grade level. So you're not going to get incredible digging power. You're not going to get the best proportional movements and everything, you know, push a stick forward, it goes and you, you pull it back a little, but you still get the same feedback. So there's an increasing push to motorize like the Bruder toys or really anything that's relatively 116th and 120th scale or 112th scale around that range. Because if you look at the next step up from the Diecast Masters 330 and all the associated um, Diecast RC equipment that is or isn't licensed, uh, you're looking at hydraulic stuff, which can cost anywhere from one to like $20,000 for a piece of equipment. So, you know, you get a lot of guys out there, they're, they're operators or they're not operators, but they just like equipment. And because of this pricing disparity in getting RC construction equipment, it's just not feasible for a lot of people. So there's a growing community out there that's modifying like toy grade stuff, as well as putting motors inside brooder stuff to meet their needs and what they want. So. It, it's pretty cool to be a part of. Um, I'm still working on my first couple of projects, um, you know, but there's a, there's, it, you know, there's a sense of community out there and people willing to share their ideas and how they've converted products or how they've made different 3D printed parts to make like adapters or mounts for motors. It's, it's, it's nice to see. And it's a, it's a little, little side tangent of, you know, collecting scale models and everything. Hey, it, it all it all correlates. I mean, technically, yep. those Bruder stuff there are scale models, so it, it definitely it definitely translates. So, be sure to keep us updated. You know, as you're as you're going along with the projects, put it up on your social media yep. sites. I'm sure we'd all love to see it. I think what we want to do now is when when as we're closing the video, um, I just think we want to discuss maybe the state of the hobby overall, kind of everything that's going on. Uh, this can encompass, you know, where the hobby is as a whole, where we would like to see it go, just our final thoughts. Um, I'll start off. Uh, I, I think this year, like the, the I'd, I'd say the past 15 months or so has definitely been, has been difficult for everybody involved, whether it's somebody that's very low on the totem pole, like myself, a YouTube creator, a collector, uh, the other end of the spectrum, obviously your, your major, major die cast companies, uh, everybody's feeling it. And, uh, it's, it's been rough, but we appreciate everybody in the community support, um, support your local small businesses for sure. Definitely your, your local hobby shops, uh, your model companies and everything is reciprocal in the world and it's going to bounce back. Nothing lasts forever. Um, there's in the, in the immediate short-term future, I can't get into anything more specifically, but there's a lot of great things to look forward to this year from a few different manufacturers that I'm directly associated with. Um, but you know, it's, it's just times are tough for everybody. There's a lot of people that aren't working and we know that this hobby is, is just that it's a hobby. This is not a necessity. This is something you do with leftover funds when you've put food on the table and you paid your bills. Um, so we appreciate everybody and heartfelt appreciation for everybody that continues to pour money into this. And, uh, again, I, I just wanted to give a heartfelt thank you. You know, we're, we're getting back to the community aspect and everything between 
all the smaller dealers out there, collectors, and, you know, really getting to know people in the hobby. You know, there was someone out there that I won't name, but there was a collector out there having a hard time, a long-term, long-time collector, and he actually had to make the tough decision to sell off all his uh, models. Now people came together and, you know, we're trying to buy little things here and there and offer, offer words of encouragement to, you know, just see that kind of thing through what we're dealing with right now. It, at the end of the day, a lot of us here are just doing this for fun or, you know, to get our minds off of other things. But yeah, it's, it's neat to see or good to see that people are, you know, out there and doing similar things, but also other parts of life come in, you know, people are willing to help as well. So yeah, we'll get through this. Absolutely. Well said. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. This has been fun. Um, as far as you guys watching, let us know in the comment section below if you guys want us to do more of these. Wanted to say, guys, thank you very much. Joe, thank you for, for doing this and putting this together. I personally have really, really enjoyed it. For everybody watching at home, thank you for sticking with us. Let us know down in the comment section below if you've enjoyed this kind of thing. Maybe we can do this every few months, kind of bring you some information on what's in the works in the models community, what's coming out and our thoughts on, on just generally what's going on. So let us know down in the comment section below if you'd like to see more of this done. And uh, once again, thank you, Joe. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Tommy. All right, that's All right. it. Thanks, yeah. guys.